We are almost ready to go for our winter bird count for kids, nature in your classroom session. We'll see if birds come over to the feeder while we're waiting. They're taking a break. All right. Hello, my friends. My name is Raya and I am super excited for today because I love, love, love talking about birds. So this is our first Nature in Your Classroom live stream, uh, kind of like a outdoor field trip in a way, um, virtually, it, for 2021. And um, usually our live streams are sort of grade by grade, but this one we thought we'd do a more general one on a really fantastic topic. There is a chickadee on the camera right now. Um, and uh, we are going to focus on birds. So Winter Bird Count for Kids is actually an event that we usually hold um, live every year in the winter with families and such, but this year we thought we'll go virtual because we can't exactly be face to face with you right now. So. Um, like I said, my name is Raya. I'm a teacher with Toronto and Region Conservation Authority. And I usually go into schools uh, and conduct Watershed on Wheels programs. So these are like outdoor uh, lessons about nature and the environment that take place in a schoolyard. And today we've also got my colleague Jasmine, who's going to say hello quickly because you might hear her voice later. Hello everybody, my name is Jasmine. I'm super excited. We're going to have a lot of fun today. All right, Jasmine and I are keeping our distance here. <laughs> um, so right now I'm at a feeder and you might have noticed some very brazen birds coming in. I'm speaking a little loudly, so they might be a little afraid, but the chickadees are actually quite um, confident and they seem to come close by when there are people flying right across the screen at times. Now, if you have any questions, you can put them in the chat anytime. We have some people who are perhaps able to answer on the back end. I will um, take some time at the end to answer questions on screen as well. Um, so please, by all means, put questions in the chat, no problem there. And this, will, this live stream will be available afterwards um, by the same link you got here, or perhaps um, if you are uh, looking out on our main page, you might have to wait a day before it loads onto our uh, TRCA main YouTube page. I'd like to show you our setup here. So I'm gonna come around and I want to also say, if you can't hear me, please uh, let Jasmine know in the chat and she'll give me a little speak louder clue. We have got a couple of feeders going. <laughs> so as you can see, there are birds flying around and we've actually got a birding scope set up with a device that will allow us to see what's on that feeder using the screen. So there we have a beautiful looks like a goldfinch actually, visiting the feeder afar. All right, excellent. So the win I'm going to tell you a little bit about the history of the Winter Bird Count for Kids while we are here. Now, the Winter Bird Count for Kids itself has a bit of a short history, but it's rooted in an event that has a very long history. Back in the year 1900, there was... A, um, a, an idea that was formed for a, well, I guess the idea was that there were so many um, folks that were doing a lot of hunting of birds. And this hunting was becoming a concern that maybe the bird population was actually declining. And so scientists were starting to get worried about the numbers of birds and there was a fellow who decided that rather than hunting birds around Christmas time, around winter time, they were going to do what's called a bird census and they would count the birds instead. And so on December 25th in 1900, there were 
25 locations across North America, where, including Toronto, where a total of 27 people um, across North America counted birds on Christmas Day. So it was called the Christmas Bird Count, and it's been running since that time. It's the longest running citizen science project. Citizen science is when people who aren't necessarily in a scientific field, they can also help to gather data, gather information. So the Christmas Bird Count started back then, and now there are over 2,000 locations with over 60,000 people who take part in it. It's not always, always on December 25th, sometimes it's on other days, but the Christmas bird count has become a really, really big event around North America. In 2007, there was the first version for kids that happened in California. And then um, a few years later, Birds Canada started running the kid version as well. And we took it on um, as a winter bird count for kids. So it's a little bit different, but it's got that same idea behind it as the Christmas bird count for kids. So by learning about what different birds are in an area, it helps scientists understand how many birds there are if their numbers change over the years. And it helps us understand also where birds might be spending their time. So maybe there's a bird type or bird species that used to not be in an area and then it shifted north. And so that could help us understand that, well, maybe the climate is actually changing too. And it's a good clue to teach us about what's going on with climate change. So there's a lot of reasons why we want to study birds. Now, I'm going to go through a few specific bird species, and we'll come back to this camera here and there. If there's anything that we haven't seen yet, Jasmine, maybe you can give me a little shout out to say, Raya, come back to the scope. Oh, <laughs> I don't know if you saw that one. Look kind of like a chickadee with a funny, a different shaped body, but that was a nuthatch. And they're a really cool bird. Uh, when they're on trees, then their head is facing down instead of up like other birds. So it's a good clue for what type of bird that is. Okay, I'm going to do something a little awkward for a moment. I'm going to switch the camera to another, oops, another device. Sorry, guys. And that way, when I do a walkabout, it will work out beautifully. <laughs> okay, so... Let's talk about some specific bird species we might be finding in the GTA, in the Greater Toronto Area. We'll start off with this one here. So this one, we already know, we saw it flying around the feeder. And this is our friend, the chickadee. Now, this is a black cap chickadee. That's the one we mostly have in this area. There are other types of chickadees in other parts of the world or in other parts of Canada even. What's one really fun thing about uh, birding is to listen for the birds and hear what sounds they make. So let's hear one of the chickadee sounds. It kind of sounds like the chickadee's going, hey, sweetie, hey, sweetie. Super cool. So that is a sound chickadees will make if they're trying to find their friends. And there's another sound you might be more familiar with. Let's hear this one. Chickadee dee dee dee. <laughs> so that's a chickadee dee dee sound. And the more D's that the chickadee does, the more alarmed they are. So maybe that's kind of a warning sound um, because there's something that's happening and they want to let other, other birds know what's going on. Okay, another bird to talk about that we might come across in this area, we might expect to see this guy. Oh, such a cutie. About the size of a chickadee, maybe a little bit bigger. This is called a dark-eyed junco. And when I see these guys in November, um, then I'm like, yay, winter's here, because we don't have them in the summer. They're a bird that comes around for the winter only and then heads out again. And when I see them flying, now underneath this tail, it's hard to see in this picture, but there are some white feathers on the underside. So mostly it's a dark, bird, dark head, dark back, dark wings, but under the tail there are these white feathers and when it takes off there's a little burst of white just at its back end because you can see those white feathers showing. When we're learning about birds it's good to also think about what kind of beak the bird has. So this one has a bit of a not a really pointy pointy beak, a bit of a small beak which is wide. All right 
So another one that we might come across in the city. Dun, da, da, da. This one here. Any guesses what that bird might be? Let's hear it. Let's see what this one sounds like. <laughs> Excellent. I want all of you to be your best crow ever. Everybody um, sitting at home at your computers, give a big caw, caw. You don't have to turn your micro microphone off mute, leave it on mute, but I want you all to be going caw, 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 just to uh, feel the crow in you. One, two, three, caw, caw. <laughs> nice. Your parents are all like, what's going on? Okay. Um, crows, I just, just a little bit about crows. So they're bigger than a chickadee, bigger than a junco. They are bigger than a robin. We often compare bird size to robins. Um, and they're really, really smart. They can even recognize faces. And if somebody's been nice to a crow and brought them things they like to eat, for instance, then the crow might also bring gifts for that person. That has happened in the past. So the crows are pretty remarkable, smart animals. This guy here. Do you think you have seen this bird before? You might be saying, nope, never seen that one, Raya. Well, I bet that each and every one of you living in the GTA has seen this bird and just not realized it. So this is a European starling. They're not a native species to Canada, um, but they are really common now. They might just look like a blackbird if you see them out and about in the city, but they actually have these speckles underneath, um, depending on the lighting and the time of year, they might be more pronounced. And the starling has the coolest sound to me. The first time I sort of learned the starling sound, I remember I was actually in a parking lot and I heard what I thought was a bunch of R2-D2 droids. I, I swear, I thought, I thought it was R2-D2s in the parking lot. This is what it sounded like. So if you hear that kind of sound, sometimes they make different sounds as well, but if you hear that kind of jittery um, sound that to me sounds really droid-like, then you've probably got starlings around. All right, just a couple more that I wanted to talk about. Um, I'll show you quickly that we do still have some bird activity. Maybe you can see the flight action on the feeder. We'll go back to that camera after this. This guy here and this gal here. So you might be calling out Cardinal. Yes, it's a Cardinal. This is the male Cardinal the boy, and this is the girl cardinal, the female. And you can see that they both have these red beaks, same shape, they both have a crest at the top of their head. But the female has a much more subdued color, like she's more drab, more brown, right? And it, that, if you think about it, it makes sense because she's guarding the eggs sitting on the nest. She doesn't want to stand out. If she was bright like the male, then the predators would be like, oh, I see you right away, I'm gonna eat your eggs, and predator gets a nice lunch. But the poor female cardinal doesn't have any more eggs to sit on. So that's our cardinal. Let's see what the cardinal sounds like. Now, people like to use a lot of mnemonic devices. That means like a clue to remember bird sounds. And for the cardinal, a good clue is it sounds like it's going birdie, birdie, chirp, 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 or cheer, cheer, cheer. Birdie, birdie. Let's hear it again. <laughs> Pretty cool. Okay, uh, this one here. This is a bird you might say, Raya, it's not really that interesting. It doesn't have bright colors on it. This is a, another bird that only comes in the winter though. And it's called an American tree sparrow. And you might say, I know sparrows. That's not the sparrow I know. Well, you might know this sparrow. So this is from a Sibley's book about birds. And this one here is a house sparrow. That's the one we mostly have in Toronto that we see all over the place. They have a little black spot in the front. And they're super common. But there are lots of different types of sparrows. This one, like I said, an American tree sparrow. They've got this eye stripe. They've got gray above the eye, like an eyebrow almost, and they have a reddish cap. It's hard to see in that picture. They have got a wing bar here. So when you start looking for these details, you actually start noticing, wow, there are a lot more types of birds out there than I thought. Last one, and this one we're not going to see today. 
this one I wanted to show you anyway because it's so cool and there are so many types of ducks that actually come to Toronto from the north for the winter because to them Toronto's winter is warm it's like how we go down to, might go down to Florida in the winter right so these birds this one here lives in the as far north as the Arctic and they come down to Toronto for our warm winters to swim around this one is called a long tail duck check out that tail and the long-tailed duck has one of my favorite, favorite, favorite bird sounds. To me, it kind of sounds like it's going, omelette, omelette. Let's see how I did there. <laughs> All right, so I was kind of in the right key. If you are somebody who is near Lake Ontario and you go down to the shore, you might see this one. You might hear them from a distance. You might hear... A thousand or two thousand of them all hanging out going ah, 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 at the same time it sounds like a long-tailed duck party so cool so these are some of the birds just some of them that we could come across um, not today with the long-tailed duck now I'm, I'm gonna go on this over this sheet later but if you were to go to the a link in the chat or in the description um, for birds Canada they have a bird tally form that you can either print out or you can kind of copy it and make your own and really, all you're doing is writing down the name of the bird, how many you saw, and totaling it up. We want to make sure we're not counting the same bird twice. So what I usually do, if there's like a few chickadees flying around, I think, okay, how many chickadees did I see at once? What was the biggest number? And that's the number I'll put in my tally. We'll go over the rest of it later on, because I want to get exploring a bit here. But I also wanted to show you that on that Bird Canada, Birds Canada link, there is a way to make a customized photo identification guide. If you click on the photo guide there and you put a pin on your location on the map and then put the date, then you can print out a sheet that has birds that specifically might be in your area on that date. And that way, when you go out, you'll have a great guide to go and look for your birds. We can see our chickadee. There's some hawks. There's some, a swan as well. Some other ducks. So many ducks. So this is a great guide for, um, for using whether with your students or just at home. All right, I think we'll have a look back at the screen and see if there's anybody new showing up. Let's see, oh, we've seen our chickadees. There's a white-breasted nuthatch. So we have a white-breasted and a red-breasted nuthatch in this part of Ontario that we sometimes see. That's another white-breasted one. So the red-breasted looks similar, but they're a little bit smaller and they have a kind of a reddish belly, red breast. Hey, chickadee. <laughs> now it sounds like earlier, I was kind of hesitating. So usually I'm used to seeing goldfinches here, but the birds we saw in the feeder earlier might've actually been pine siskins which I personally need to learn more about. Um, they looked a little different than goldfinches, but my brain automatically went to goldfinch. So if you said pine siskin, then you were probably correct and I was wrong on that one. <laughs> I like to be clear about these things. Oh, there might be a pine siskin that just flew off. Okay, we're gonna do a little exploring and talk about um, some of the habitats, the things in a habitat that birds really need in order to be in a space. So if you're a bird, if you're any animal, including humans, you need four different parts of a habitat to survive. So if you're in grade four, maybe you're learning this this year, grade fives and sixes, you might remember this from another year. We need water to drink, right? We need food to eat. We need shelter. And in my case today, um, the shelter that I'm using is my jacket and my four layers underneath my jacket. We need um, air to breathe. So if everybody, everybody would like to take a moment, take a deep breath. Oh, let's do one more of those. They're so good. One more. So if a habitat, if a home can provide food, water, shelter, and air, oxygen, then that habitat hopefully will find wildlife in it. And when we're talking about birds, then they really like to eat different seeds. 
So let's see if we can find any plants that are producing seeds. Here we have what looks like they used to be ferns. So these ones actually produce spores. But any plant that might produce seeds, so these, there's a, there are a lot of cedar trees here, and there are some birds that specifically love to eat the seeds out of cedar trees. Um, and so that's the food part for a lot of birds. A lot of birds eat insects instead of seeds. And they then need to have habitats that provide good homes for insects too. So like a meadow has a lot of plants that insects like to eat from. And if there are insects, then that means that there could be birds. So sometimes the habitat is like a bit of a double whammy. <laughs> you need to have the uh, good habitat for the food, and then the food is part of a good habitat for the birds. I mentioned shelter. I wear uh, clothes to stay warm. Sometimes I go inside to stay warm and protect myself from the elements. Birds, they have feathers for part of their shelter, but they also will build a shelter. So for instance, this is a type of nest called a, a cup nest. So it's kind of made in a bit of a cup design. Some birds will build their nest for laying eggs on the ground and they might not even build much of one. They might just kind of wiggle around and make a bit of a depression. Um, so there are different types of nests and these sorts of nests can provide great shelter for different types of birds. If we look at the material a bird might use, well, a habitat needs to provide the right material. So this bird, we can see grasses in there, but we can also see that they're using a bunch of mud. So we need to make sure that the habitats that exist stay healthy and have these components. We might be like, well, mud, that's not important to anybody, but it could be really important for the type of bird that uses it for their nest. This one is super tiny. Check this out. So I'm holding it. If I can show you a little size comparison. There's my hand. This is um, a nest for one of the smallest types of birds around. You can probably guess that's a hummingbird nest. You can see there's lichen. The bird has used lichen on the outside. And I was reading last summer actually that in the inside they'll collect spider webbing to make the inside of the nest and then put the lichen around it. And you'll notice they also will build their nest on branches and twigs. So we need to make sure that they have that kind of, um, those kinds of vegetation, that kind of plants in their habitat. When birds are building nests, they want to make sure they're in a great secure space. So here we can see that this bird has gone between two branches and they have kind of almost tied their nest to the branches. Now, before we leave this space and go back to counting, we'll do some counting afterwards. Um, I just wanted to show you, we have a taxidermy bird here that's very special. And um, this one has been around for, gosh, probably 30 years. We've educated a lot of students using this particular taxidermied organism. This is a beautiful great horned owl. A little rough around the edges. I guess he's been around for so long. <laughs> but um, owls are another type of bird that we might see more in the winter. They do exist year round, but we might notice them more in the winter. Now, owls, if we do happen to be lucky enough to spot an owl, we want to be super, super respectful. Um, there's something, I don't know if you've heard of the word etiquette, but etiquette is basically a way to be respectful of something else and a, way, a good way to behave, right? So with owls, good owl etiquette is that if you see one, don't go up close to it, don't scare it because they like to hunt at night. And during the daytime, they're trying to save up their energy so they can hunt at night. And if they are um, trying to get away from you, fly away from you, they're using up valuable energy and that means they have to hunt more. And so we wanna make sure that if we see them, we can respect them by admiring them, but then not sticking around for too long, not making a lot of noise, really not disturbing them. All right, our beautiful great horned owl, by the way, just so you all know, these are not ears. These are feather tufts. Their ears are underneath their feathers and they're actually at different heights. So one ear is higher than the other ear. And that way the owl can really pinpoint um, where, what, where a sound is coming from. All right, so we've done some pretty good exploration, learning a bit about 
bird habitats, spaces bird might need, birds might need. And while we're heading up to our feeders, I'll mention that with the winter bird count for kids, um, usually you're counting wild birds. In this case, we kind of put the feed onto the food onto feeder so we could show you some birds. There's another program called Feeder Watch that you could also do in order to uh, to submit bird counts from feeders. This is not necessarily bird related, but I happened upon some <laughs> some scat. So for scatologists out there, that means poop. Shh, it's actually not that disgusting. So if for those scatologists, people who study scat, this is deer scat, and there are lots of deer in this area, especially this year since we haven't been able to have overnight field trips right here. So we're seeing a lot more deer tracks every day. Okay, heading back to our feeders. Let's see if we can start doing a little bit of a count and we'll check in on questions. Now, as I'm walking back, I'm gonna ask for our um, a survey to be put up on our chat. And it's just a one question survey that I'd love to have everybody um, just click on to answer for a sec. So we can understand who's joining us today. We'd love to see who's watching. So if you click on the survey link, that maybe should be in the chat, it's a little straw poll. Um, then you'll see the first question is, are you a teacher watching with students? Our second question is, are you a parent or maybe a caregiver who's homeschooling and watching with your, your students, your children? Or are you an individual who's watching just on your own, just for fun? So if you click on that, then we have a sense of who's here today. All right. Now, Jasmine, are there any questions at this point before we start a tally that I can address? Just a couple, perhaps. Sure. So we have one question from a viewer, and they're asking, what season do birds build their nests? Oh, good question. So, oh, <laughs> you know what? I'm getting mixed up here. There is, I'll answer that in one sec. There is a um, woodpecker that we're trying to get our camera onto. It's pretty hard to sometimes move the camera about, but if you look to the right of the feeder, there is a tree that has a little movement there. Let's see if we can focus on it. So while we're focusing on that, um, what season do they build their nests? Yes. So the only reason birds build nests is actually to lay eggs. And um, other than that, they don't really need the nests as much. So they need shelter from the wind using their feathers and maybe finding little holes and things to hang out in. But they don't really need the nests other than to build, <laughs> to lay eggs. So they're building those nests in the spring as they get ready to lay their eggs. Oh, look at that beautiful woodpecker. So this guy, that one, that, thank you for the question, by the way, about the, about the nest building. So this looks like, I think a hairy woodpecker. There's a type of woodpecker called a downy woodpecker too. And um, they're pretty similar, but hairy woodpeckers have bigger beaks. The downy woodpecker beak is not quite as as heavy and large. Sometimes it's pretty hard to focus on these guys quickly. I think that's a hairy. Now, if you notice at the top of the woodpecker's head, there is no red spot. If there was a red spot, that would be a, a male woodpecker, a boy. And with no red spot, that's a female. Oh, now I think it's a downy. See, I keep, I sometimes mix up those two. Nope, looks big. Looks like, I can't tell. <laughs> if, so, if somebody wants to comment in the chat, maybe, uh, one of our back-end experts can say, hey, Raya, I can't believe you don't know that that is a blank. It's either hairy or downy. Um, Jasmine, were there any other questions at this point, or shall we talk about tallying? I have one more question, Raya. Which bird has the biggest nest? Oh, my gosh. Which bird has the biggest nest? That is a good question. Well, around here, um, I don't know for sure if it's the biggest, biggest one, but osprey have really big nests. So an osprey is a large bird of prey and they tend to make these really big nests on, sometimes people put up nesting platforms really, really high on posts. Um, in the world, you know, ostriches are really big birds. I don't know what their nest is like though. So I'm not sure if I can confirm that one, 
But around here, you know, I'm going to stick with osprey. I'm going to say that they have some of the bigger nests. Ooh, I should show you. I wonder if this will work. <laughs> I'm going to zoom into something across the field here. So if you notice that tree in the middle, that is a, it's not a typical cedar that we have here. It's another kind of cedar. And there's a big hole in the middle. So that hole is made by a pileated woodpecker. And a pileated woodpecker is the same as woody woodpecker, if you're familiar with that guy. <laughs> um, so they have that crest on the top of their head. They're bigger than the one we just saw, the hairy or the downy. Um, they're at least twice the size, if not bigger. And they make these huge, huge holes. We call them tree cavities that other birds then might nest in. So the woodpecker's doing it to get insects and other birds then might find that hole, that tree cavity and be like, oh, this is perfect shelter for me. I'm gonna live here and make my nest. And sometimes other mammals too, maybe squirrels and things like that. The question about nests got me thinking about that hole up there. All right, so I think what we're going to do at this point is look at the tally sheet a little bit more closely. It is 2.30. If, if you need to go, then that's totally fine. And we want to thank you so much for joining us. We'll spend a bit more time looking at a few more questions and just kind of looking at the tally sheet a bit more and seeing what we would write down for our count. Okay, so thank you so much for those who have to leave. But please stay with us if you can for another few minutes. So our tally sheet. Today um, is January 13th, I believe. So for the tally sheet, the folks that we submit the information to, we give the information to, they want to know some other stuff too. So what date is it? Where were we? So in this case, I would say Oak Ridges or Richmond Hill. And the count site, well, gosh, I would say this is near a building, but it's in a kind of a forest. What the weather is like, our start time was two o'clock, finish time will be about 2.40 probably. And kind of who was involved, right? How many kids, how many adults? So when you have your information, you can actually submit it in a few different ways. You can share your checklist, you can submit it as an official um, kind of bird count, or you can email it to Birds Canada. So this is all on that bird form, if you were bird tally form, if you were to print it off or have a look at it online. The species um, is what we can talk about a little bit. So we know that we have seen a woodpecker and I would probably look up in a book if it was a hairy or a downy just to confirm for myself. And then I'd write that in here and I'd say one. And that would be my total because I don't know that we'll see a second one today. For chickadees, how many chickadees do you think we saw at once? I'm going to guess that, not guess, I'm going to think back and say maybe there were four chickadees at one time. There could have been more, but I don't want to overestimate. So I'm, I would write black cap chickadee here and I would say one, two, three, four, and then put the number four. I didn't bring a pencil out with me, so you'll have to imagine. And so we would write down our bird species here and tally them up, total them up, and then submit them. You could also go to eBird to submit any bird sightings that you see. I'm going to have another look here and see if there's anybody to make out. And Jasmine, were there other questions that you can have a look at? Yes, we have one more question, Raya. And the question is, uh, where do birds put their extra food? Oh my gosh, I love that you ask that. Where do birds put their extra food? So, I'm just gonna turn my camera so I can also be seeing you. <laughs> the black cap chickadee, you might have noticed, and maybe I can even come up to this original feeder. Jasmine checking out the scope there. So the black cap chickadee, who was like, you're coming at me with a camera? What are you doing? Um, they do collect extra food and they will put it into what's called a cache. So they will take a seed, perhaps one of these sunflower seeds that I put out for them. Hey buddy. And they will um, hide it somewhere. And then they'll come back and take another seed and hide that somewhere. So maybe they're finding little cracks in trees to hide their seeds, things like that. And the black capped chickadee then has so many hiding places. I don't know if I mentioned this earlier that their brain actually gets Bigger. Scientists have checked this out. They've checked out the size of a chickadee's brain 
and realize it grows in the winter because they're trying to memorize where they have hidden all this food. Oh, can you see that chickadee there? <laughs> I'm hoping that I've got the camera in a good position to see them. Like I said, they're pretty brazen. They're pretty happy to come and get food, even if there's a person around. Other birds are much more skittish. All right, let's go back to our scope. Let's see if anybody's hanging out. Oops, sorry team. Hanging out on the feeder. There's the roof. Looks like it's empty for the moment. That's okay. Any more questions, Jasmine, before we sign off? Um, one question. Do you see snowy owls around here? Oh, good question. So I have seen snowy owls in the GTA. I haven't personally seen one at this site, but I have seen them in the GTA. And um, the thing about uh, seeing owls, part of the owl etiquette is not to tell people where you've necessarily seen an owl because we don't want to draw a lot of people to it. Um, so they like open spaces so that they can find rodents as they're running around to eat. Um, and they're really, oh gosh, if you do have a chance to see an owl in your life, respectfully, then it kind of fills your heart with this warmth because they're such beautiful, um, impressive creatures and they just they look wise. That's why we say the wise old owl, right? Because they have these big eyes. So um, they're lovely. And yeah, we have snowy owls in Toronto for sure. I have another question here. The question is, why are, do you think the birds are okay with humans being so close? <laughs> That's a good question. So most birds aren't. Um, we know owls aren't. We talked about that earlier. And um, some birds, they kind of get used to... Um, their space and their what they're able to do. So they know if they can fly away fast, then they're probably pretty safe. Now with the chickadees, I'm hearing a sound. Oh, it's a woodpecker pecking away at the tree up uh, on the top of my head. Um, so with the chickadees, why are they so comfortable? I think part of it maybe is just knowing like this morning when we were kind of setting up and trying to draw the chickadees in with their food, with the food, then we were also talking and walking here and they got used to us. Um, now, if it was a spot that was in the wilderness where people never went, chickadees might be a bit more scared, but chickadees can learn. Like I said, they're pretty smart. They have a really good memory to hide all that their food in different places. So I guess they can learn um, also about how people are in a certain area, if they're friend or foe, if they're friendly or if they're not gonna be friendly. That's a good question. I don't have the best answer for that one. Okay, I have one, we'll do one final question. And the question is, how many birds can fit in one nest? Oh, wow. So most birds, I'm sort of generalizing here. A lot of birds that I'm familiar with will lay between three, like they might lay three or four eggs per nest. They might lay six to eight. Um, some might lay just one. So it kind of changes depending on the species. But... Um, down at, okay, I'm going to tell you this, at Tommy Thompson Park, if you go in there in the spring, let's say June, for instance, and you walk in about, I don't know, two kilometers. Tommy Thompson Park is the same as the Leslie Street Spit in downtown Toronto. So on a weekend, when it's open, if you go down, then um, walk in for about half an hour or so. And on the left, just where the, there's kind of a main trail, it looks like a road, where that main trail or road splits, on the left, if you go down a little trail, you'll see the outdoor classroom. And if you go in there, then inside, you will see barn swallows with their babies. And there might be like six babies poking their heads out of the nest, <laughs> waiting for the adults to come and feed them food. So they're going, ah, um, and it's really cool. So it looks like the nest is just bursting with birds. So you'll be surprised how many can squeeze into one nest sometimes. All right. So on that note, is there anything there, Jasmine? Or are we, they're kind of staying away from that feeder for the moment? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Coming and going. So I would like to 
finish off by thanking you for joining us today. Um, and just some ideas for things you can do in your classroom. You can do a winter bird count and submit your information. You can join in February, gosh, is it 13th to 15th? There is a backyard bird count. 12 to 15 that is organized um, and you can join that one as well there are lots of bird count weekends and events it's actually pretty good homework for the weekend go look at birds right um, <laughs> and count the birds so you can do these kinds of events you can also just learn more about birds and by learning more about birds then you can understand what all of us all of you can do to make sure their habitats stay healthy right we don't want to damage bird habitats if we're you know walking through a park and we're ripping stems in the winter that we think are not useful for anyone maybe a bird wanted to eat those seeds so there's lots of different ways that we can learn about birds and then do things that help the birds to have healthy spaces um, so i encourage you to keep learning about birds check out that birds canada website it's awesome and thank you so much for joining the winter bird count we are going to do our best to continue to do live streams so you can check out the trca toronto and region conservation authorities events page um, to keep up to date on what live streams are happening. We're crossing fingers that we can still do one in a couple of weeks, but we'll keep you posted. Thank you, everybody, and keep exploring. Keep getting outside.